This is Radio TV Phono Nut, and what we have is a little wooden cased True Tone, which was Western Auto's house brand AM solid state table radio, probably from the mid to late 60s. This is a Japanese built set. And if we look on the back, we see it still has the old style interlock plug, like a tube set. And there's our uh, caution, do not remove back or you'll fry yourself warning. And it says it'll operate on AC or DC. And then over here, here's the weird part. The typo, not true tone, but true tune model DC1716. A product of New York Transistor Corporation, New York, New York. Now best I can tell, that particular company was behind the York brand, which was a cheap, low-end brand of Japanese electronics, or later from Taiwan and Hong Kong. I know during the 70s and 80s, I seem to remember, or actually not during the 70s and 80s, or especially not during the 70s. Let me rephrase that. In my younger years, I remember seeing stuff that was made in the 70s and 80s that was branded York, and it was cheap, low-end dollar store stuff that was about on par with sound design and electrophonic, Juliet, etc. This radio works, but I don't think it's as loud as it should be. It has gotten louder than it was when I first plugged it in for the first time, which makes me think the... Uh, old capacitors are, are on their way out and leaving the radio in operation sort of helped them reform a little bit. And that's wide open and you really can't tell because of the audio processing that takes place in the camera and on YouTube but that's really not as loud as what I think this should be and that's tuned to one of the louder AM stations around. A guy who does boring play-by-play, -play, making fun of David Locke getting excited uh, for the Utah Jazz and their game-winning shot. See, that's and wide open on another to station. To, and to watch, and I think with, when it comes to Doc Rivers, that's, that's Doc Rivers. All right, let's Doc. open it up and, and see Rivers. what we... They were nice enough to print a schematic in the on the back of the radio. And this is a four transistor set. We have our converter transistor, IF amplifier transistor, our driver transistor, and our audio output transistor. And this is a hot chassis set without a power transformer. And the design is typical of a lot of table radios from the 60s and early 70s, both U.S. made and Japanese made. They run the audio output stage off of a high voltage directly uh, rectified from the AC line and they have a big dropping resistor to give a lower voltage for the other stages in the radio. And here's our chassis. It's clearly Japanese. You can see the audio output transistor on a heat sink and it's a dual speaker set which dual speaker radios, that was kind of a really just a selling gimmick. They could have used one large speaker and got the same performance that they're getting from these two smaller speakers. Actually, the performance might have been even better with a larger speaker, but, you know, when they proudly boasted dual speakers on the front of the set, then that, that made customers jump all over it because they thought they were getting something that they really weren't. But we got a nice ferrite antenna here, an open air variable tuning condenser. You can see that uh, filter capacitor has been replaced, but other than that, that's about all I see that's been done. So let's pull this apart and see if we can get some improved performance here. Here's the chassis removed from the cabinet. Not really going to be the easiest thing to work on. They have our output transistor heat sink attached to the speaker and they must have been using the speaker as a part of a heat sink too because you can I can tell they got a little amount of heat sink grease on the back of this heat sink where it mates with the speaker and the way this board is in here it's going to be kind of difficult to get to 
we might have to remove the board from the rest of the frame there but at least it won't or it shouldn't interfere with the tuning string arrangement so just knowing how crappy these early Japanese capacitors are I just decided to go ahead and just start pulling them and checking them and here's one here an electrolytic with a red bottom supposed to be a hundred microfarad it's reading 0.75 microfarad so that one is dry as a bone here's another hundred microfarad this one with a black bottom uh, it's reading about 120 it could have probably stayed but while I'm in here I might as well go ahead and get rid of it here's the volume control coupling cap another red bottom job it's supposed to be 5 microfarad reading 8.5 now it wouldn't cause, that condition wouldn't cause low audio, but and since there's really not enough voltage on it to really matter, it probably won't make any difference one way or another, but again, while I got it apart, I just went ahead and replaced it. Here's one of the .01 microfarad capacitors at 600 volts. I'm surprised they didn't use a disc cap for that application, but I've had lots of problems out of these. And it looks like this one has a problem. I'm not even getting a well-defined eye opening on the uh, cap tester here. Now let's check it for leakage. Yeah, we, we, we've got some leakage here. Yeah, there's cap number two. Looks like we're starting off with the same results. And it looks like it's leaking worse than number one was. Now, let me show you. Now, this is an old school type capacitor checker. It tests capacitors at rated working voltage. Now, it's more suited for your high voltage capacitors than little low voltage electrolytics. But since we work on more high voltage equipment than anything else, this comes in handy. Here's a modern capacitance meter, and as you can see, it's reading 0 .017 microfarad. Now, if I relied solely on this, I would, assume, I would assume that this capacitor is perfectly good, and the reason it's re registering what it is is because this meter, it only tests capacitance. It really doesn't test for leakage, and it's, there's so low a voltage involved that it won't even it won't even cause the capacitor sh to show its uh, ugly defects. So when you're dealing with high voltage capacitors, you really need one of the old school testers that actually check them at rated voltage. These are good for finding a dried out electrolytic capacitor or verifying the value of a new electrolytic capacitor, but they're really not much good at determining how good an old high voltage paper capacitor is, or in this case paper and oil I believe. Here's another 100 microfarad electrolytic clocking in at 443. Now usually when they read real high on one of these modern capacitance meters that means that the capacitor is on the leaky side, major leaky side. And if you look at this capacitor you see it has a bulge on the side and I don't like it when capacitors have bulges anywhere on the on the case okay back on the true tone radio I uh, did some looking and I found a factory boo-boo let's look here at the base of the audio output transistor and you'll see that it comes down through a resistor R16 here and goes to ground and then we have a film capacitor that also connects to the base and goes to ground. Well, those two items were not grounded. They were just hanging in midair. In fact, one end of that capacitor was just dangling loose when I got the set. Okay, I soldered these items back to ground, which involved running a piece of wire from these points over to a point of circuit ground. It changed the tonal quality a little bit, which I would expect with this capacitor here from base to ground. And it might have got a tad bit louder, but not enough to really notice anything. Uh, that dried out 
100 microfarad capacitor didn't seem to have much effect on anything. So now we get to continue to dig around here. And it's also possible that this radio is as loud as it ever was intended. All right, let's check some voltages on the audio output transistor. Let's start with the collector. Got 110 volts there. I can sounds good. Base 6.8. Emitter 6.2. Sounds about right. Okay, this looks like the electrolytic that was dried out, that replacing it really didn't do anything for it. Uh, one end of it attaches to one end of the tone control, which also attaches to the base of the output transistor and the collector of the driver transistor, and this resistor here. And of course the other end of this capacitor connects to one end of this resistor, comes down to the base of the driver transistor, comes down through this resistor, and connects to your low B plus line. Okay, we have it all back together and I've done about all I can do to this. I can't really find anything wrong. It's pretty good on the two AM stations that are Highly higher modulated, as in louder. But it's still not quite up to par on the others. And who knows, as cheap as this radio was, it, it might have never worked any better. More of your gospel favorites in minutes. Come by Old Town Family Pharmacy for more than just a prescription. We have lots of gifts. Of course, all that tone control is is just a treble cut. And when you move it towards the extreme bass position, it also decreases your volume. Classic Southern and Gospel Country, good old spirituals, church hymns, and even grass gospel. It's all here. 1390 AM and 93.1 FM WMER. Time Gospel Radio playing all your gospel favorites. Hallelujah. It is loud enough now that it sometimes rattles the case, so that's probably about as good as it's going to get. Chicago Newsflash. Jimmy Butler brings it every night. Oh, Jimmy Butler's. monster so far. He's not doing a ton. 22 strikeouts and 8 walks. It seems about a 262 against him so far this season. In 2013, Marte will be ineligible to participate in this year's playoffs unless his suspension is... But it's loud enough to listen to in a Fox News. Average room, this, this is month, not the one you'd want to put in your workshop to colors and listen to over the sound of the power tools, but it'll do pretty good for a small room. It's now one and two to Romero. Jordan getting the start behind the plate. WSB out of Atlanta, so this thing's pulling in a few distant stations. And play. We got them out. We helped a lot of people out. It felt good to know I could really make a difference. Right here, close to home. Cam coming. He's back in safely. Three to nothing. Okay, I touched up the alignment a tad bit, and that woke it up a little. It wasn't that bad at all. 
This, uh, this yellow transformer right here was off ever so slightly in the RF section of the tuning condenser was off a little bit. I said these little cheap radios, you have to do everything you can to them to get a squeeze every little bit of performance that you can get out of them. Oh yes, and I got this out of there. They just had it slop, sloppily tack soldered on and it broke loose. So to make it look neater, I just obtained one of our newer, smaller capacitors and soldered it directly to the circuit board like you're supposed to. And one of the .01 microfarad capacitors that was leaky was this C24. It's a AC line to ground capacitor. I'm uh, not sure where the other one went. Really don't care. I just know it was bad, so we replaced it. These Japanese radios like this are really not a joy to work on. They're just they're just not laid out well, and actually they really weren't made to be worked on. I imagine this radio probably cost no more than maybe fourteen ninety nine whenever it was new. And even back in the mid-60s, people didn't really have these repaired when something serious went wrong with them. They just tossed them in the garbage, and that was that. So the manufacturer probably figured, you know, if the customer gets five or ten years out of it and it quits, they're just going to throw it away anyway. So why should we make it serviceable? And on this schematic, they don't even give you component values. It's like... C22, R41, etc. So just to recap, we replaced a 100 microfarad capacitor that was totally dried out. We replaced a couple of .01 microfarad capacitors that were leaky, one of which was the AC line bypass. We fixed a wiring screw up from the factory and we touched up the alignment for just just a little bit and we replaced the other capacitors too they weren't that great but they were still better than the dried out one but while I had it apart I might as well just go ahead and get the rest of them while I'm there that ought to make some people happy I replaced all of the capacitors Montana. alright we're back together as far as I can tell, the better True Tone radios were made by Arvin, and the lower end ones were Japanese imports. Oh, yeah. All right, that's about as good as we can get it. Thanks for watching, and more to come later.